Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we have a mega bonus questions episode for you. And the internet kept dropping and Dave is very stressed out, but it's still really good. Enjoy! So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for tuning in to this very special episode of Terrible Lizard because Dave is in a chaotic mess. It is 2pm and he's been up since 5, I think. Uh, he is, uh, and he's in his office at Queen Mary University. So he's got an office background, I can see. I might put a clip up for you so you can see it later. But he spent the last month moving house as well as doing a thousand other things all at the same time because he can't prioritise. And no, it's because I booked things months is... ago before I knew the house exchange date. <laughs> and so, uh, basically, we decided to do a mega questions episode. So as Dave didn't have to go away and do lots of uh, revision and that sort of thing. So we're going to do this on the fly. Are you happy, Dave? Well, yes. <laughs> I haven't heard the questions yet. We'll, we'll see how well, my th- happiness progresses. Over I, the mean, I, mean, I mean, basically, basically, he's going to get grumpy. But I don't think he should get grumpy because I don't think everybody's listened to every single episode. And therefore, if we get one like that, you can say Izzy could answer this one and we'll see if I can. And if I can't, there is nothing wrong with asking obvious questions that I don't know the answer to. I... So, this is from Trisha. Hi, Izzy and Dave. Absolutely adore the podcast. Of course, Trisha. Have a few questions. So we'll go with one and see how we get on. I recently found out about, oh dear, Cotty Law Heinchus. Cotty Law Heinchus? A Cotylorhynchus? That would be it. Spelling is hard. Cotylorhynchus, which is so cute. It reminds me of a seal when their face is all smushed in. I'm curious about their big feet with the nasty claws. What were they likely to be doing with these? They don't look like they can rear up and fight with them, at least not on land. If they're not fighting with them, could they be used as some sort of traction? If so, would it be possible that their feet could help them with that underwater running thing that hippos do? So, um, what is a Cotylorhynchus? For those I can't of remember don't because know? it's not a dinosaur, they're Permian. Um, ah, and I can't oh, even no. remember if they're on the Therapsid branch or the Synapsid branch. I've got a sneaking suspicion they might even be on the Therapsid branch. And therefore, ultimately, go on towards mammals. So they're wow. they're really, really, really not dinosaurs by quite a long way in in time and evolutionary history. They have got big feet with big claws on. I imagine they're probably digging with them, surface scratch digging. We think rhynchosaurs are doing something similar. We talk about various sauropods doing something similar. I imagine it's that, but these are an animal beyond. There's various memes of them because they have big big feet and small head so there's a head in hand moment of a giant hand with a small head but yeah i i'm out sorry not my group never worked on it never read any of the research fine, fine. Not don't dinosaurs. worry trisha <laughs> don't worry trisha we're going to move on to your second question which i know dave is going to love oh, he's going to love this one because it's really scientific which is it would enhance my enjoyment of super mario she says if dave <laughs> could speculate on what kind of dinosaur yoshi might be yeah i don't play nintendo if i've never had a console um, I, I know, old, he's, I know he's green with with a big head and legs, and you ride he him. He looks and... like some. I'd have said some sort of like theropods. That but, doesn't narrow you know. it down a lot, though, does it? I think it does. I'd say carnivorous theropod, even though it's not very spiky teeth or anything. And also, would we um, consider changing uh, Izzy's sign off from "Stay Stompy" to "Stay Chompy"? Uh, and I think we could, we could do that. So uh, uh, I'll consider that maybe next series. So. This one's from Sophia. It says, Hiya, Dave and Izzy. We're talking about relative arm length. Oh, and this is going to link very nicely to a later thing that I did. We were talking about relative arm length in non-theropod quadruped dinosaurs and looking in pictures of photos and skeletons and noticed that often the front legs appear shorter than the back legs in some cases, like triceratops skeleton. The difference is almost greyhound-like. Is this a general rule or is it just for quadruped dinosaurs or is there... Is it a general rule for land invertebrates? As human beings tend to have shorter arms and legs, and we have a quick um, shift at apes and monkeys, and there seems to be opposites. Basically, she's saying it's weirder because apes have longer arms and legs. Look forward to hearing your answers in the podcast soon. Best regards, Sophia. So, what is that about? Why do 
lots of like triceratops and actually most sauropods have shorter front legs and longer rear legs. Well, at least in part, it's probably down to them ancestrally being bipedal. And so they've secondarily adopted a quadrupedal pose. And to a certain extent, the arms haven't caught up yet. But that really only explains some of it because, you know, although big shifts like that can can cause some big changes quite quickly, and also some big shifts like that can can kind of drag on forever. At least some of these groups, you are talking about animals that had been, you know, quadrupedal for tens of millions of years. And if there was a really significant disadvantage to having shorter forelimbs than hind limbs, that's the sort of thing you'd expect natural selection to get rid of sooner or later and probably sooner um so at the bare minimum there's clearly no big disadvantage to having relatively short forelimbs compared to your hind limbs um the issue then becomes you know well, why not why, why isn't that such a big issue and i suspect it's at least in part because the build of dinosaurs we have talked about this before you know they have these giant leg muscles that basically attach to the base of the tail or even about halfway down the tail and that means the legs are going to be more muscular and more effective at propelling the the animal forward than the arms are. And it's not like the arms are like just there to hold them up. But there's an element of that. We, we actually have the inverse in pterosaurs where they have their giant flight muscles, also their running muscles. And so their legs are spindly little things that are basically there to be almost a pair of crutches to hold it up. And then almost all the work is coming from the arms. I think most dinosaurs, it's kind of the inverse. So we're saying that we're saying that pterosaurs are more like Jim Bros with big chunky arms, and dinosaurs are more like Jim Bunnies with like focus on the glute and the thigh work. Um, assuming that that's accurate, because <laughs> as those who've ever watched me ever <laughs> know, I'm not the most gym friendly body to body morphotype. But broadly, yes. Um, again, musculature and length are not necessarily the same thing. Obviously, you can have very long legs without much muscle on them or short legs with lots, etc. But I think that drive for long hind limbs to give you that long stride coupled with most of the muscle being based around the back legs, or at least it's easier to add lots of big muscle there than it is on the shoulders when the arms aren't kind of bolted to the body in the same way. There isn't a support structure that the way there is the tail for those big muscles. Um, I think he's driving at least some of it. So it's the fact that the pelvis and the hips are kind of built for holding weight, and because in the past they were bipedal, and therefore their arms You've are You've already less been like... built that way. You're going to carry yeah. on. In the same way that birds have relatively big legs, because ancestrally they're bipedal, and they've really separated their units into the front legs for flight and the, and the back legs for, for walking. Um, you've got this holdover where everything was built on the back legs to make them move around and so when they drop onto all fours you know the evolutionary pathway is probably already driving bigger and bigger legs and bigger and bigger muscle and you know to a certain extent it's inverted commas easier for that to carry on but bear in mind i really don't work on this stuff no i mean it's 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 interesting um just considering the opinion because i did like a fool i went on the tiktok because yesterday afternoon I was like going, that does bother me. And it must bother other people too as much as it bothers me. But I did a little rant about Allosaurus having very long arms compared to other theropods of a similar, you know, carnivore type situation, T-Rex and Abelisaurus, etc. Having tiddly little arms in comparison. And why that was and specifying that it probably wasn't something to do with catching anything because it can't see what it's catching and it can't put its hands in its mouth etc it's it's kind of a this one weird adaptation that's bothered me for a long time and loads of people have been giving their suggestions so i thought i would ask dave before going back to our normal questions i'm just going to run these ideas past you dave and see what you think because obviously quite a few people said it was for giving each other high fives or hugs I just want to cut you off slightly when you say it's been bothering you for a while. I think it's been bothering you since I brought it up because there's literally a section on this in my last book. 
Yes, yes, no, no, yeah, that is. But that was a while ago. <laughs> in terms of Izzy, no, that not, wasn't. Oh, it's been bothering me for a while. I've been thinking carefully about this brackets ever since you told I me. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't. Yeah, but that, I think there's a fairly important prefix about where that idea might have come from. But that may have just listened... dropped out. But but anybody who's listened to this podcast, Dave, ninety nine point nine percent of me learning about dinosaurs is you. <laughs> so you can't. You know, I have not. I didn't this at all. I have a few dinosaur books which I have read. However, majority of the information that actually goes in and retains in my head, you are saying, and then I'm going, but what about? And you're going, no, don't be silly. And I'm going, oh, but I continue to think the silly things when you say don't be silly. Yeah, we That's know. That's the thing. Exactly. So I'm a Kestrel Moonstrider. They say, I personally, though, it was, think it was a male suprema, like lizards that stand and kind of clash into each other using front legs to rip at the opponent. So was there some sort of fighting thing that they could have used their arms for like that? I mean, could have done, yes. Was it male, male? No, because I, we've got loads and loads and loads of Allosaurus and they've all got the same arms. So if it is, it's no sex differences. Are there any sex differences? Because that came up a lot, if there are other sex dysmorphia between the two. So the horrible thing we've got, Allosaurus, so listen to our, I think the last episode with my Utah travails, um, we have a hell of a lot of Allosaurus, but it's almost all completely disarticulated. So these quarries of thousands of bones from dozens of animals, but they're all mixed up. But at the same time, if you've got that many, it is very likely that you've got some male and female in there. And you really should see some consistent differences if that was present and it's just not. In fact, there's, you know, there's not really any small armed allosaurs anyway. You know, across all the allosaurs, you go, OK, well, we found at least one female for this species. And hey, they've got weird small arms or they don't have big claws or they have less musculature or... No, they're, they're, they're really very consistent. And so we don't know, presumably, um, if there's a big difference in male and female size either. Nope. Do we? No, no, God, no, don't no. have a clue. Excellent, because um, there, there was a, there's a lot of talk on the TikTok about whether if females were bigger than the males, maybe they act more like hyenas, and therefore, even though males are using them for mounting purposes for mating as a securing thing, maybe the females are doing that too. The bit, the bigger female thing came about because it was said for tyrannosaurs, and it was said for tyrannosaurs based off the fact that for a bunch of birds of prey. Females are bigger than males, but not just things like, you know, eagles and hawks, but into some owls as well. But we don't really know what is driving that in detail. And our best guess is it's probably something to do with niche partitioning. So in other, you know, if you fly, you fly very differently if you're a little bit bigger because of the, we talked about this for pterosaur growth, you know, the different shapes of the wings versus weight. And so the suggestion is is that basically if females and males are different sizes, they can hunt different things and that's more productive oh. when they're looking after a nest full of eggs. The other suggestion is there is a drive for bigger female sizes so they can produce bigger eggs, which will that's give the what chicks a greater survival ship chance. But neither of those things is likely to be true of theropods because they're not big flying or animals that are relatively big and flying at close to the limit of what you can fly and how you hunt so there's really no reason at all to think that the size driven se the sexual dimorphism of size that we see in birds of prey has anything to do with the fact that they're predatory or at least it's fundamentally linked to the fact that they're flying so there's no way that that would link to theropods so there's no reason at all to think that if there is sexual size dimorphism in theropod, it would be females bigger because of birds of prey. It's a totally different ecological system. So, not that. Okay, this is this is um, XX Kodak XX, and this comes up a lot. It's it's to get foliage out the way your back legs. So you're knocking down trees. Or you're you're basically don't look skeptical, Dave. We're talking about oh, Allosaurus, right? I think that's quite a nice right? idea. Allosaurus, right? Knocking down like, trees. They're, they're bipedal. They've got long arms. They use their arms to swish. You know, little that move sticks out the way as they go. Okay, you're looking at me like I'm insane. Fair enough. And also, many animals, like if they're using it to sort of terraform and stuff and break apart things, many animals have uses for bark, such as wolves for chewing bark to clear their teeth. So maybe they're preparing things, nests, building nests. I mean, do we no. do we have any? 
Uh, there's there's no reason to get anything like that, Scotty God. Uh, oh, really? Because again, you'd see it in in other animals. You know, tyrannosaurs and abelisaurs have these massively reduced arms. They're clearly capable of digging and building appropriate nests to rear their offspring without them. So that's not going to be driving it in certain other groups. If that's if that's their only or primary function. But salamanders, according to Bryn, have arms to push plants out the way of their legs or something. But they also uh, walk because they're quadrupeds. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> they are using their arms to push stuff out the way, but they walk with... I mean, a bipedal salamander is not getting anywhere fast at all on land. And you don't think it's a case of, like, if they fall over, it's a case of faster get-up time? Well, it might be, but again, you know... Tyrannosaurs get along fine without it. Abelisaurs get on fine without it. Almost all the birds get on fine without being able to, you know, strike, you know, ostriches and emu and cassowary. I mean, elephants, videos of elephants and hippo and rhino getting up, they are not fast. But that doesn't mean it's really a detriment to them. I think people think that any minor defect is somehow some enormous evolutionary dead end. And, you know, the reality is the world doesn't work like that with these trade offs. Well, Swift and Buy and Fat Viking 27 and even uh, Bright all say it's for stability when crouching or perhaps they walked on all fours to keep low, to avoid detection from play, then switch to two legs for sprint mode. And can't what walk about on sneaking? Two, can't walk on four legs. They they've can't not, walk at all on four legs, so a two. No, they're not going to be what able about, to. What about, so Spirits Creation Studio says... Do we know what the babies look like? Maybe babies, they walked on four legs and stood upright as they got older and perhaps the babies needed to climb trees and so therefore it could be used for a climbing thing. We've got some small ones, but no very young ones. Uh, there are some sauropodomorphs which are shifting from quadrupedal to bipedal as they get older, um, but their arms shrink as a result. And so, again, that doesn't explain why you'd have hangover long arms. Spirit Creation Studios also said um, they were thinking more like the babies had comically big heads they needed to grow into before they could stand upright and that would be funny but fair enough so it's not for it balance or making standing i mean if for example they had to walk along a lot of trees or against the crevice being able to hold out their arms for balance no okay no, because that's not what they're doing that's not what the environment I mean, is it's it's you know it's an idea what if they're trying to stand up like a hip-hop dancer do they stand up in a particular way? Yes, they do, actually. In a lot of spinny, creative ways, Dave. You should watch some hip-hop videos. I, it's very I, fun. I clearly haven't seen enough. Here's one which is up your street. Uh, swimming with a picture of a fish. This is from your Ron Bonororo. I said they're not fish. They don't have gills. They're, they're not fish, but they do. They could. Could they be swimming? What, Allosaurus or? Yes, Allosaurus, well, and that's why they need the arms. No, because they don't the operate in that. So well, you're they, saying that, but we don't know this, Dave. You need to tell us this. So, so it's also the quadrupedal thing. They they can't pronate. That is, they cannot rotate their arms so that the palms face downwards, which is pretty critical if you want to be a quadruped, and also pretty critical if you want to doggy paddle and push water backwards. You're basically karate chopping, and so walking along the edge of your little fingers or trying to swim by pushing with the edge of your arms. Um, and the swimming thing, their arms are in the way of their legs as well. If you try to do any kind of motion like that, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And I, I do like the fact that a lot of people said, are oh, their arms like wings? So a lot of a lot of people do understand that they have a, that sort of thing. This is my favourite um, one, is that they're trying to move either their infants or their eggs around. So that's been argued again, but crocodiles do fine without that. Birds do fine without that. And there are some birds that move their eggs around. Again, tyrannosaurs and abelisaurs are doing fine without it. Lots of other theropods have much smaller arms, even if they're very well built. So things like the alvarosaurs, they've got these giant, relatively giant claws with very robust hands, but the arms are absolutely tiny. There's no way they'd be able to pick an egg up. And yet again, this hasn't affected these animals for tens or even hundred million years. It's clearly no evolutionary dead end to not be able to move eggs or some massive advantage to be able to do that. And you've got your mouth, which is, you know, what, Cats do and dogs. Yeah, right, right. But like mammals do it, and you know, snakes don't move. Snakes don't move their babies around. And 
Uh, you know, there's lots of things that can do it without arms and don't need to do it full stop. They have to be using their arms for something, Dave. This is this is why we're talking. We're going yes, through but all of speculating the... randomly or coming up with things that flat contradict the evidence is not is the way fun. to get to that answer. It's, it is fun. <laughs> no, no, no. It is. It might not be science, but <laughs> it's fun. For example, it's so they. This is from user four one eight four four three eight. Zero one eight. Is no one just called like Steve or Bethany? No, is, don't be. You're so twenty twenty. No, okay. So this is this is uh, this is their answer, which I think is excellent. Which is it's so they can play the guitar while the T Rex plays the ukulele. Perfect. And I know they've got you know the the, the semi lunate carpal that let them play guitar. I know these things. But anyway, well, you can at least strum because then it rotates. <laughs> that is true, but you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't do all very many chords. That's the difficulty well only three i mean there's fingers. a lot of people who refuse to believe the fact that they could hold their prey whilst biting the neck so if they were going after a sauropod saying getting the neck whilst holding onto the shoulders seems to be a sort of like common thing that people have in their head as a way of sort of like holding the prey down well, and the pinning thing. it somehow if that's one of those things is like i'm sure they could do that but whether or not it's a massive advantage enough to generate these big structures because that because that's ultimately what it is this is this is the you know the cost benefits analysis or evolutionary costs of all of this building those big bulky muscly arms costs effectively energy and then lugging them around your entire life costs a hell of a lot of energy and what do they actually add and is that more than not having them and my central argument is i've yet to see a coherent argument for why these are so crucial that allosaurs and carcharodontosaurs and spinosaurs and some other, you know, relatively early theropods have these early ceratosaurs have these big, muscly, clawed arms when things like tyrannosaurs do fine without them, things like abelosaurs do fine without them. Uh, and abelosaurs are in sauropod dominated faunas and are probably primarily hunting and killing sauropods. So if this is an essential thing for killing sauropods, why is it missing in the other group that did the exact same behavior and otherwise have a very similar biology? It therefore looks like it's not an essential thing. So why are they still got them? I mean, I, I'd like Ian B. Have you thought about the wind? Not not overly. <laughs> um, he says, I've always thought dinosaurs look quite aerodynamic, maybe strong winds due to warmer weather, so to grab the ground and hunker down when it's a gale, which I think is a great answer. It's wrong, but it's great. There was um, uh, some papers not too long ago about Anolis, so these little lizards that you get in the Caribbean. And they tend to, you know, natural variation, they tend to have some longer and shorter legs. And a hurricane took loads of them out and they went and measured them and found that, I can't remember if the legs are longer or shorter, because you could, I can't remember the details of the paper. Because if a longer leg, you might have a longer grip, but a shorter leg, you might be able to hunker closer to the tree. But anyway, they basically found that these were more likely to survive hurricanes because they don't get blown off. And of course, scientists being scientists, they went and collect some adults and stuck them on trees <laughs> and then stuck them in a wind tunnel and tried to blow the adults off to see this how high a wind you could survive with different <laughs> arm and leg lengths. So that, wow. that absolutely is a thing. I suspect it's probably not true of Allosaurus, however. Um, both uh, uh, Jesus, I assume, and Velocicatper. I should see what you did Oops. there, Velocicatper. Um, they both say uh, to scratch their bellies, but could it be a cleaning thing? They don't have much range of motion. They're, they're really quite mm. limited. They don't have anything like the flexibility that we do or that a cat does, both either in the arms or in the legs. And again, if you, if you wanted to reach a scratch everywhere, you'd want really long, thin arms that could reach miles not really short, fat, muscly Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. arms. You know, bod bodybuilders can't... Have you seen that guy? There's a bodybuilder in the gym and someone's got a post-it note with kick me on it and just slapped it between his shoulders and he can't even reach over because his biceps are so big. When he tries to reach up, they bulge and push his arm out. It's not ah. his biceps at the issue, it's his lats, I think. Uh, probably uh, well, be, anyway... But yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's a problem I have all the time, Dave, just being yeah. so, you know, muscly. There's a lot of people who say, um, you know, were they feathered? Is it displays of either scaring or attracting and that sort of thing? But we've just got no evidence for it. We don't even know if they're feathered. And if they were, yeah. they were probably, well, they're going to be relatively simple feathers and probably not that 
cupboard. They don't the, have quill knobs on the big. ulna bone, do no, they? No, no. Um, and so that that it doesn't put pay to that argument. But again, if you're if you're trying to maximise a display, longer, thinner arms that can support more feathers are going to be more effective as a display than than relatively short, stubby ones. And they've already got crests, haven't they? On yeah, their, they've got on they've got the big snout crest and then the um, big. Um, kind of hornlets over the eyes. Well, I, I'm very disappointed that we're never going to find the answer to this question. It seems that it's going to haunt me forever and it's not fair. Oh, well. It's not fair. <laughs> wait, 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 <laughs> until, wait, until, wait until you look at anything else we've ever studied. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I wrote an entire book about the things we don't know. <laughs> Matt Hill, who's discovered us a couple of weeks ago, although this was written a few weeks before now, so about a month ago now. My favourite line so far has been the posh dinosaur at the end of the episodes in season two. Raw, darling, raw, classic. Anyway, the question. So right now, I'm on season three, episode one, because Dave knows what all of this means and he has ways to go. I'm wondering if you guys have done or will do an episode on the distinctions between dinosaurs and other animals that make them not dinosaurs. For example, what is this about a Dimitridon that makes it not a dinosaur? Ditto for marine reptiles, early fish, pterosaurs, etc. Uh, you've discussed the concept generally on a, several occasions and touched on it in a bird's episode, but I'm still confused about what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. Simplest answer today. Go for it. So, yeah, simplest answer. Oh boy. So there are two answers that ultimately fold back onto themselves and are sort of the same answer. So one of which is phylogeny. We have looked at enormous numbers of traits of all these different things and we have put together what we think is as accurate as can be like a family tree of whole evolutionary history of pretty much everything lots of gaps in it lots of errors etc but fundamentally we built an evolutionary family tree and what we have done as scientists is drawn a line on that tree and said right after that everything is a dinosaur these things are all unique and share enough features and have certain things in common that we think they're worthy of giving a name to and that name in this context happens to be dinosaur. So there is an evolutionary argument, which is, we've looked at this family tree, all these things are related, they all have some fundamentals in common that make them pretty distinctive, that's the line. And so we have a line for birds, and we have a line for fish, and we have a line for mammals, and we have a line for primates, we have a line for humans, and platypus, and tapirs, and echidnas, and whatever else you, you, you want to call. I like your random animal selection. It's very Yeah, global. I know, and very, very monetary. I was trying to say monotolism, and echidna came out, but uh, we can skip over that minor yeah, detail. They both so, lay eggs. So that's the evolutionary argument. Then there's the kind of anatomical detailed argument, which is, and there are like, you can get lists of these, they have these features. So the one I always remember, and I'm sure it's updated and I'm sure it's changed, but this is one I remember from my PhD days, a deltopectoral crest. So that's a big flange of bone on the humerus, the upper arm bone, that is more than 30% of the length of the humerus. Basically nothing except dinosaurs has that. They all have smaller deltopectoral crests and dinosaurs have big ones. So if you've got a big deltopectoral crest, it's a dinosaur basically by definition. But those two are ultimately the same thing because when we've done these big analyses, we've looked at the features and gone, what is a feature in common that is effectively shared by everything after this line? Well, one of those happens to be the shape of the deltopectoral crest. So that's a really good thing for identifying them. So we'll use that one. Um, so it does kind of fold back on itself. Like, you know, one of the definitions of, of humans, at least, I think, is reduced hair. Because compared to any other primate, we are very hairless. And so it's a very simple, clear characteristic. And yes, there's some exceptions. We might find something weird in the fossil record. There's stuff in the fossil record we don't know quite how hairy it is. We may one day, who knows, find a there reduced... naked mole rat. ...haired tamarind or marmoset in South America. But that's not that. really going to affect the fact that that's still a good definition of humans. Um, naked and it, mole and rats. it's the same. Yeah, but I said primate and naked mole rats. Oh, yeah, you did, didn't you? I, I heard You're mammal. You mammal. say primate. Yeah, and I, I didn't heard say mammal because there's also whales. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, I'm not quite as stupid as I look or as stupid as you think I am. <laughs> which are two different things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that, that, that's ultimately it, is that there is a phylogeny or evolutionary argument, but ultimately it's still a somewhat artificial line of us drawing the line and going there. But there's also the anatomical argument, which is at least partly drawn from the data that produced the evolutionary one. But it, as, as with all taxonomy, we definitely got a couple of taxonomy episodes. It's basically a convenience, really. 
because it's easier to go this and 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 this than it is to go, you know, that lot, them. Uh, and you know and humans do this for everything you know if i say helicopter you have a certain kind of thing in your mind if i say car you have a different thing and if i say like a car but with a bigger boot oh a subdivision of cars that are uh, i think pickup trucks or yeah or a hatch or whatever it is oh well that's really clearly part of cars but it is its own subdivision and i know what you mean it, it's that kind of game we're playing but you could ultimately write a list of characters and helicopter it has the whirling blades and flies car it has four wheels that narrows them down really quite a lot but it is more than an epistemological problem it is there is a way of categorizing something if you found a fossil you could easily categorize it as dinosaur or not dinosaur by... depending on quite yeah. what bits of it you've got because true things you know yeah th- there's a lot of stuff that you know we're, we're hazarding a guess or it, or it is a best guess um based on the available data fair enough I've got a question from Roy. Make my way through the complete dinosaur. Thanks for the recommendation. Do we have an estimate on the diversity of avians, as in birds, before and soon after the KT mass extinction? Any gauge for the fraction of lineages that were able to survive and then diversify? So how many sort of species of birds lived past the KT in, extinction? In terms of the number of actual species, I don't think we've got any good estimates. In terms of the number of lineages... Yeah, they get a kicking. Um, there has been a couple of papers on this. I think Nick Longrich did one about seven, eight years ago, but I, I'd have to go and check. But the short version, you know, off the top of my head, it's something like, you know, 60, 70%. You know, we lost most. It's not like birds sailed through the KT while the dinosaurs got absolutely savaged. The birds got absolutely savaged as well, just not quite to the same extent. We've got a lovely question next from... Paris, who says, given Dave's knowledge on uh, tyrannosaurs, can he elaborate more on how much convergent feeding behaviours he would expect between T. rex and Torvosaurus? reason I ask is because pictures of Torvosaurus skulls seem to show a more robust bone-heavy skull compared to contemporary predators like Allosaurus. Hey, to Allosaurus. Their teeth also seem more closely to resemble the spike teeth of a T. rex. And allegedly, they have a strong bite in the same direction of the T. rex. Are these wrong assumptions on my end? And if not, did Torvosaurus have fuel nasals as well? A fused nasals fused as nasals. well. So, so Torvosaurus doesn't have fused nasals. It does have a weirdly kind of long skull. So it, it, it does have big teeth. I think they're relatively robust. I'd have to check. I should know because literally I'm writing a paper about theropod feeding at the moment and Torvosaurus is in it. Um, and I didn't write that bit. Uh, Christoph Hendricks from Argentina wrote that bit. And although I read it, I can't remember immediately. But yes, off the top of my head, Torvosaurus does have a big head. It's relatively robust. That might just be because it's big. Because again, you tend to get bigger, heavier things because of the, you know, some scaling and mechanical properties. It does have some, it does really have some long teeth. I think they're thicker than the average Allosaur. I don't think they're that, they're certainly not Tyrannosaurine thick. I think if I compared it to anything, I'd probably compare it to something like an Aleoramine. So these are the long-snouted Tyrannosaurs, because Torvosaurus has got this long face. And those are actually probably doing something a little bit different to other Tyrannosaurs, because they've got a really long face. And of course, you lose some of the bite power. The longer something is, basically, basic jaw mechanics, because it's effectively a lever, you get faster but you get weaker so yeah it's powerful bite i think in powerful bite in absolute terms but not that powerful in relative terms given how big the animal is and that you've got you've always got to trade off those kind of two numbers i have i probably i was going to say i was was going to compare myself to an animal i actually don't have no idea but it's you can have a very powerful absolute bite simply because you are big and therefore you must have a lot of muscle and you must have a lot of weight and you can deliver a lot of power or you can have a lot of power relative to your size so i think the absolute torvosaurus numbers are pretty big but when you compare it to something like t or a comparable size tyrannosaur like say daspletosaurus they're going to have a much bigger bite because they're a similar size but they're built for that extra power and so they're going to deliver more so absolute numbers yes relative numbers maybe not that bad uh, or not that good for Torvosaurus. So I don't think it's probably got... It, it, it doesn't have the nasals and it doesn't have the really weird premaxillary teeth. 
So I don't think it's either killing or feeding in quite the way that a Tyrannosaur would. It is probably doing something a bit unusual for its time and place, but it's not some Jurassic Tyrannosaur in terms of its like ecology and feeding biology. So it's got a long, thin sort of you know mouth. Yeah. So that's going to be good for catching smaller, faster. Well, it's going to have things. a fast bite, but again, fast mm. in relative terms for a very big animal. And again, maybe there's that trade-off because it's not going to be absolutely fast because it's still a dirty grey animal, but it's going to be faster than you would expect for its size because it's probably traded that power for, for speed. Marcus asks, so we have Aerodactylus and now we have Petrodactyle, Stonefinger, I seem to remember. Uh, so the next two should be Hydrodactyle and Pyrodactyle, and then we'd have the uh, pterosaurs for all full elements. Yes. Yes. I, I do agree um, to that. Is that confirmation that you'll name the next? No. <laughs> oh! Because they're named after different things. I mean, there, there yeah. is a pyroraptor. So you've got Ooh. the, you've got the, um, the dromaeosaur. The that was in Prehistoric Planet. Noah um, asks. We in Melbourne, Australia, are lucky enough to have a genuine 85% Triceratops horridus which I've just got home from revisiting. It's magnificent, and looking it in the eye socket feels very special. The skull is, however, slightly warped after the 67 million years, so I'm curious, is there a way of telling which side of the skull is more true to life than the other? Is there a way that I can work out which is the more accurate side, ideally without specialist knowledge? Mm. Not, not easily. I think it's one of those things where you kind of have to get your eye in, and once you've seen a bunch of these things, you can usually just see it and i'm sorry but that's that's the best that i can offer look at lots of photos of lots of different triceratops and you'll soon start to and and other ceratopsians because that gross frill shape is the same for pretty much all of them and once you've done that you kind of get a feel for why at what angle it should extend out the back of the skull and quite how it should spread out and quite where it should curl and quite where it should tuck and if it doesn't look right it's the not right bit yeah, uh, and, th and that's that's more or less it, you know. In the same, you know, it's it's that same CGI thing where you know you 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 watch a movie and they've you know digitally restored or replaced the actor or added someone. You go, that doesn't look quite right. But if you're asked to put your finger on exactly what it is that doesn't look quite right, it could be very difficult indeed to say it. It just doesn't look right. Yeah. I also, I should I should add the reason that these fossils are obviously misshapen is because they. I've spent a lot of time under rock and rock doesn't stay totally still and they get squished. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, it's quite plastic. Give it enough time. OK, so um, I'm going to mispronounce things again now. So could Dave give us his thoughts on the Pitacosaurus? This is from Jay. Cetacosaur. Uh, we've the... done Cetacosaurus loud. I know we've done Cetacosaurus. It's the Cetacosaur Ripenomamus fight fossil. Do you yes. know which one that is? Yes. Yes. So is it a fight or could it be some other situation like scavenging? So I'm going to be honest today, I couldn't run them pay for you. I've known about these things for ages because Jordan Mallon is a good friend of mine and he's the second or third author on the paper. And Jordan was told to keep a very close lid on it. So I hadn't even seen photos until the paper came out. But he knew I was working on the Microraptor with the mammal in it. And as part of that paper, we were doing a review of bites and stomach contents and interactions between predators and prey in the fossil record. And that included a bunch from China, like Microraptor, which is roughly from the same time and place. And so he said, I've got a thing we're working on, which is a dinosaur other animal interaction. And I'd welcome a bit of feedback and a bit of knowledge so I can feed that into the paper. So he was super, super cagey. So that's all I knew until the paper came out. And then, yeah, I... I, I looked at the photos and gone, oh, that looks cool. And that's as far as I got <laughs> it. But it's, it's one of those things where I don't think we can really know. Again, long-time listeners will know my tendency for these things is always to underinterpret. I think that's the safest option. I would much rather say we don't know or this is possible, but there's no particular reason to think it's head and shoulders above the other hypotheses without strong data. And with two animals that died instantaneously like that, or almost instantaneously like that, particularly in an area where we know there's stuff going on with things like carbon monoxide leaks and methane leaks and stuff like this, with you know, all kind of volcanic leaks, which is probably killing things, at least occasionally, in probably some quite nasty ways. 
you know, it's hard to know what might have driven that exact interaction. That Cetacosaurus could have been dead for two minutes when the mammal turned up. Or they could have happily been walking side by side, ignoring each other until they got a shock of poisonous gas and their behaviour went haywire. And then they died like this. I'm over-speculating this way, having not read the paper and having not looked at the fossil in detail. Um, but I would say that we know stuff like this goes on under those conditions. Whereas, in contrast to something like the classic fighting dinosaurs of the Protoceratops and the Velociraptor, that is one where everyone's pretty much happy it was a sand dune collapse. So there's no particular reason that there's any outside agency or there could be any toxicity or... You know, one of them could still have some kind of weird, you know, neurological disease. You know, rabies makes animals attack things that they would never normally attack or never normally go near. Still counts as a fight, though. That still well, counts it, as a fight, does, rabies. Well, it does, but this, this is the problem with the interpretation, is that, you know, oh, Velociraptor pre was an active predator of Protoceratops, and it's like, well, those two are together. That's the actual thing we actually know. You know, that's the only thing about which we are 100% sure about. And the rest becomes a certain degree of how likely is it? And often we don't really know how likely it is because it's very hard to study among living species. We don't know how often do rabid animals randomly attack other much bigger species? How often does an animal of size X attack animal of size Y and stuff like this? Um, so it then gives us very little to start to build those bases on. Uh, and that's what makes it all very tricky. Also things like drowning, because animals climb each other to stop each other from drowning. That could easily look like a fight. Uh, it could, though I don't think there's any particular reason to think these were water preserved, or at least not initially. There's lots and lots of options. It's very hard to pick between them. And while obviously, on average... Animals fight each other a lot more and kill and eat each other a lot more than they do randomly get mad cow disease or rabies or are poisoned or etc. Those things do happen and we don't know in any particular case what's actually going on or at least it, it's very, very hard to narrow it down, which is why multiple cases are good. You know, this is, this is my argument for theropods primarily predating juvenile dinosaurs. Because almost every record we've ever got of predation or attempted predation is on a juvenile. Not on a massive sauropod that can kick you. That's what the data says. And it's not one isolated incident that we're trying to build everything off. It's repeated incidents and that directly matches what we see in extant species. And therefore, that's probably what's going on most of the time. But even then, at least, at least a couple of them, there probably were adult specialist predators who, in this case, happened to have attacked a juvenile. And that's the data point. But as that's one data point out of, you know, dozens, rather than one of one, it's a bit easier. Oris, as Darkid, says, What do you think is the weirdest or most interesting proposed feeding methods for a pterosaur? And I think it's the filter feeding methods. I think it's that one. That is just bizarre to me. To I mean, a filter feeding is very cool, would... but it also turns up repeatedly you know we had the new ichthyosaur just this week as a filter feeder, which I think is the first in the in the Triassic. Um, you know, there's a giant anomaly carid that's filter feeding. There's obviously a bunch of whales that do it. There's a bunch of pterosaurs that do it. There's a bunch of birds that do it. A bunch of mammals in whales that do it. Um, so filter feeding is cool. It's like being my size and living off sprinkles. So it, I don't uh, think in that regard it, it can't be considered that weird. What I find more interesting about pterosaurs, and this goes back to the allosaurs on, is the stuff they're not doing. We've got no obviously predatory pterosaur. You know, there are loads of hawks and eagles out there and owls and then you've got two different lineages of vultures which have independently acquired those features um you know the big curved beak and big curved claws is absolutely a feature of predatory birds and that includes a number of different lineages and then you know some little things like shrikes which have gone down that route as well if perhaps not as extreme nah, no pterosaurs that we know of and it's like surely there's some pterosaurs out there who thought Oh, eating other pterosaurs might be quite a good idea. They've got those nice wings, which if you tear them a bit, they'll probably come down out the sky, and then I can just, like, eat them. And there's good eating on those flight muscles. And if they're out there, we haven't found them. And maybe we haven't because, in the grand scheme of things, the pterosaur fossil record isn't very good. The vast majority of them are from marine systems, and, of course, that's not where you get most... You know, there are some sea eagles and ospreys and stuff, but they're mostly eating fish, and we've already got fish-eating pterosaurs. They're just doing it in a different way. You know, we, we're in the wrong environment to maybe pick them up. 
but I'd still thought we'd have found, particularly as beaks are often quite robust and, and survive pretty well, I would have thought if big predatory theropods that were doing like the eagle-like model, or even vulture-like models, just straight up scavengers, were out there, we'd have found something by now. And we really haven't, which makes me think that is a whole area that they never really explored evolutionarily. There are bats that catch and eat other bats. So again, we 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 know that this predatory flying animal taking other predatory f- taking other animals, and again, you know, pterosaurs and birds shared the air for at least a hundred million years. It's not just pterosaurs trying to catch and eat pterosaurs. You'd think that there'd be pterosaurs trying to catch and eat birds as part of this. Well, maybe they only ate them when they were nesting. So sort of like sat down next to a nest and gobbled them up like, you know, a good old seagull would. Well, I'm sure they did that too. But it's, as I say, it's like like that active predatory flying niche. You know, we think pterosaurs are really quite good in the air. In some ways, we think many of them were actually better flyers than birds. You know, things like peregrines make their living by being faster and more agile in the air than the birds they're hunting. If pterosaurs are faster and more agile than the birds they're hunting, or other pterosaurs, that that's surely a, you know they're that's you know that is an exaptation. They already possess the feature which would make them good at that ecological niche. I mean, maybe that there is just so many that they're so abundant that they don't need to adapt to that because any pterosaur that wants to be predatory to other birds or pterosaur could just go eat, you know, chicks and what have you pretty much all year round. Yeah, but that's not how evolution works because sooner or later there'll be a really bad year and then the ones who are better at it are the ones who will survive and there will be variation and some will be better at it. I mean, maybe maybe they did have, like, some had hook beats, but those hook beats were made of a really genified cartilage. Well, so Ramphorhynchus has a beak tip which is cartilaginous which is hooked and is a different shape to the underlying hard beak the bone Mm. underneath but that is quite unusual and it would make it not weak but it's not going to be anything like as strong as a classic bird beak but it doesn't need to be that strong as you say all you need to do is damage the wings the yeah but then you've got to eat it and unless you're swallowing them whole and i'd argue that actually swallowing a pterosaur hole is harder than swallowing a bird hole because of the wings you'd probably you'd, you'd want to do the peregrine thing we we have one that hangs around the university and so occasionally you find a pair of wings and that's what they do to pigeons they chew the wings off or chew the ends of the wings off and they just drop them because they're just spindly bits of bone with some sinew and feathers on them and then they fly off with the body which is just this ball of meat on a breastbone and pterosaurs are pretty much the same thing. So you'd want to be able to do that. I often see that. It's really sad when you go into the park and it's just like, it's a wood pigeon or something. So there's just an explosion of feathers, two wings, and it's gone. I mean, we're not short of pigeons, so I don't file it too sad, to be honest, in London. Oh, I find it oh, sad. Oh no, a it's pigeon like a, got It's like eaten. a dead angel. Uh, it's like an angel died. Just because of the look of it, it looks grisly. I mean, mo- most, most of I mean, if they're the feral pigeons, they're not particularly angelic. They're <laughs> warped feet. Falling out. That's just because they're very adapted to a new type of environment, Dave. Anyway, okay. Richard asks One of the running themes of the series is a number of fossils already discovered that would be significantly advance our knowledge but haven't yet been written up in the scientific literature. Two questions. Is there any professional convention or expectation of researchers to write things up in a timely way? And B, cheekily, Can Dave shed any light on some of the interesting fossils he knows about that hasn't yet been written about in the scientific records? You know, tap nose and that sort of thing. So what is the sort of time expectation, do you reckon? Well, so there isn't one, and that's... Certainly, there's an expectation that once you've started on something, you should do it. So there are definitely animals that have been described or named with really brief descriptions, some of them horrifyingly brief to the point that they're virtually pointless. And then it's like, well, we're going to do a much, you know, we just wanted to get the name out and now we're going to do the real detailed research. And 20 odd years later, we're still waiting for that. Yeah, that's not right. But the short version is you can't make someone do that. (laughs) Um, Well, you 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 can't. There, There is peer pressure and that's basically it. And so if people don't care enough or don't want to do it enough or think that they have better, more pressing things, that's that's what their attitude will be i try not to do this i've had a couple of things that i've tried to work on i've not got round to it and i've got back to the the researchers or the the museums in question and gone i I, i'm out It, it literally happened to me a couple of months ago someone said we've got this would you like to work on it and i said yes but i'm not going to 
because I've got too much on my plate. It will take me too long to get round to it. I think it's 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 interesting and cool. It's not interesting and cool enough to force its way onto my to-do list. So I'm going to regretfully say no. If someone else wants to do it and they're happy to collaborate, so I can do I can have some involvement but not have to lead the project, please let me know. And if I've got a window in a year or two, and you still haven't found anyone else, I'll get back to you. But for right now, I, it's it's not mine. That's proper adult behaviour, Dave. Well done. I'm very no, impressed. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, and, and, I, th- I mean, I, I would I would honestly say, you know, the vast majority of people are like that. Or, or even if you are working on it, someone says, you, can I work on it? I go, yeah. And if you want to collaborate, it's still my project, but I'm happy to, to, to work with you or... If you just want to do this little bit of it, so classically we talked about phylogenies and family trees, very often people are saying, yes, if you just want to stick it in your phylogeny and see where it comes out, go ahead and collect that data, or you just want to check something like tooth size, or you're collecting a data set on the length of skulls, I'm, I'm happy for you to take that, but the like the big description or the revision of it, like that, that's the bit I'm doing, so you can, you can take some bits of data, but I, I'm doing the big project. Of the vast majority of people do that. Unfortunately, there are people who don't. Um, I think there are there's there's kind of two separate bits to that question as well. There's a big difference between people sitting on stuff because they haven't got round to it and they should. And I'm clearly separating from people who are just too busy and have forgotten because that happens. And and who in particular might be stopping other people working on something. And the fact that stuff just gets left. So, you know, when I was in the IVPP in in China, you know, we'd go into the field regularly and we would come back with literally van loads of material from a relatively small team because there was so much. And yet there's only a limited number of researchers to go around. And so that's not people are sitting on this work not getting it done. This is people haven't got round to it. And there are way, way, way more fossils than there are researchers. And so if you go, right, I've got a couple of months free and I want to start up a project. Ooh, I'm going to work on that. You are making a choice from often quite a wide selection of things that you could work on. And then what happens is next year you go out into the field and then you find something even more interesting that's actually much more pressing for various reasons, particularly if you need grant money, which we all do, or you look for promotion, which we all want or these other things, or there's a museum exhibit and they asked us to find something like that, well, that becomes the priority and the other thing just drops off. And that thing was already the thing that you'd picked out of the 20 that you knew needed to be worked on. You see, I'm I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is community service. So instead of going next to roads and picking up litter, we should make like criminals who do petty crimes start to do basic paleo research they've been punished for enough. just getting the numbers <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean it's just it's, it's literally manpower i mean hopefully there might be a sort of way of you know in the future getting some sort of 3d modeling so it's in there and maybe a basic ai I mean, at least sort of part of it is getting system. stuff at, but this is the catalog the problem ground. so like yeah. you see this on reddit constantly is people who are you know coming into this stuff for the first time and they'll go online and they'll go where do I find the list of all dinosaur fossils ever? Uh, someone said, "Someone said, is there a list of all fossil amnio specimens? And it's like, museums don't know what they have. The idea that there's a global <laughs> list of everything we've dug up in 200 years. You know, even experienced curators in small museums don't know what they have. And not because they're lazy and not because they're not doing their job, but everything's just written in a book i used to do this even in the early 2000s i was volunteering at the natural history museum in london so it's not even doing the actual paid job that the curators were supposed to be doing and again i'm not razzing on them i was trying to help them catch up by going through and going here's all the stuff that we've sorted out in the last couple of months that isn't in the catalog enter it in the catalog and the catalog was still physical handwritten line by line I spent my gap year uh, writing out wills and probates mm. and digitising those. And that's the case of somebody had to physically take the copies, scan them in, 
and put them on the computer so that I could read them and officially sort of like mark them against, you know, medieval Latin, what these means, and get that double checked on weird queries. And yeah, it was, it just takes forever, the man hours. And I think for people born after the internet, they don't appreciate that the entire world is not on the internet. Yeah. It, and and that, that, that's, that's what it is. So the NHM, you know, for, for example, is desperately trying to catalogue its stuff. But the idea that they can just go back through something like two million lines of data entry in and 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 just do it, like just, it's always the word, why haven't they just digitised their collection? And it's like, well, because... That's 10 years worth. You know, you're right. And, and, we're, be- and we're constantly behind because we're always constantly behind because we're so hilariously underfunded. You know, again... What I was do- what I was manually doing that entry that was to help them catch up with the backlog of doing the manual entry. The idea that those people would then sit down and have pretty much an entire year of doing absolutely nothing but typing those hundreds of years of ledgers into a database and then going and finding every single specimen on the shelves and taking photos of them and adding them to that database. The time doesn't exist. It just Well, this doesn't. is why I think AI is better, because then all you need to do is get the manual person to actually physically, you know, take a photo of the data that there is. And then that can be read by one form of AI, and that can be coded by another form of AI and turned into a searchable database. That'd be good, whether the coding is good enough. Yeah, it, it, it would. So, yeah, so the, the, there is stuff which is in collections which just, you know, inverted commas, no one knows about or the people who've seen it don't realise its value because unless you're an expert on X and there are only three of them in the world and they don't go to that museum because they don't think it has any of X, it, it hasn't been picked up yet. There's stuff which we know is valuable or likely to be interesting and we haven't got round to yet, which is a separate problem. And then there's the stuff that we know people are actively sitting on. And yes, it's extremely frowned upon and lots of people are very unhappy about it, but you can't actually do anything about it, unfortunately. And we're going to be sitting on, as a podcast, a lot of extra questions because we've got about 20 more. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question because I think you know the answer to this already because we discussed it a little bit, but I thought it was a fun one to end on. So this is David, Spider Breaker. Most extinct animals we don't know the colours for. What colours would you expect a pterosaur to be based on nothing but your gut feeling? And I'm going to try and remember this one, Dave, if I can, because you're going to say most of the pterosaurs we know about are marine and we know from seabirds and flying birds that they tend to be quite monochromatic so they're very black and white and this is to do with reasons uh uh fitting well, in, in the sky classic not being able to see yeah exactly so you, you're not going to be spotted by fish so you're know, easier to be got to get the fish and get close to them and that sort of thing and because obviously there'll be some sort of selection selection seabirds don't have much difference between male and females but you might get a tiny bit of coloration around the eyes or patterning in that sort of area. And that is my answer, because that is what I remember Dave saying before, and it sounds good. Yeah, pretty much that. White underside, blue, black, (laughs) grey combination top side, colour around the head, but particularly when you've got something like Pteranodon with its crest or Nyctosaurus, probably more brighter stuff there. That's that thing, because we've talked about this, you know, the colours in these animals. That's something which we see not just in, like, kind of classic seabirds like gulls and albatross, but there's a whole bunch of other birds which hang around water, you know, like pelicans and like storks and herons and various waders, which, okay, are still birds, but from very different bits of the, the bird phylogeny. And they've all ended up with this colour scheme. And indeed, you have actually whales and sharks and dolphins and various big fish that are in and around and acting in water in that same thing have all ended up with those same colour patterns. And that really suggests that that almost like trope is there for a very solid reason. And those reasons are basically physics of light and the sea. And therefore you would expect that to hold over and probably translate pretty closely in most pterosaurs. So that's the kind of place where I think I'm, I'm quite happy for people to like, you know, use modern bird colorations as a good model for what might be in pterosaurs but that you know that is a, 
a very big special condition, like marine animals, but but a really obvious one. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for your questions. Do keep sending us in. Do please support us on Patreon. Thank you to all of those who do. Once Dave is nice and settled in and then gets the internet, I'm sure we'll go back to doing a sort of more themed episode, hopefully on that new paper that you mentioned. That'd be cool. But until next time, I mean, uh, I will stay uh, stay stompy and stay chompy, but we need to do a big rar. Uh, or a pterosaur? Would you rather pterosaurs or dinosaurs, Dave? You're going to make me do it anyway, and I'm not going to be happy either way, so I fail to see my... <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> Ignore him, listeners. He loves it. Okay, after three. One, two, three. <laughs> oh, go on. <laughs> yes! Thank you for listening to Terrible Lizards. For extra content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For questions, contact us there or on terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast Did T-Rex Run? And to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag terriblelizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy.